Good morning. Welcome back. How many of you had a good Resurrection Sunday? Now we're at the sprint to the end of the semester, right? You got this. You can do it. Hey, a couple of announcements for you, then I'll introduce our speaker and get out of the way. Uh, we have determined a name for the new restaurant that's going to be in the Scharnberg Business and Communication Center. It's going to be called the Cafe. Real, real creative. So that this is also the menu. And so there are one, two, three. There are vegetarian options up there. I don't know, I don't know what that word means because I've never had a vegetarian anything in my life, but they're up there. So it's going to be fast, fresh, and flavorful. But seriously, what I hope it does is I hope it helps some of you with gluten allergies and other allergies. We've kind of designed this so that it'll be really helpful if you're struggling with some of those things. So I can tell by the buzz in the room, you either like it or you don't. I'll find out which later when I look at my email, but that's it. That's where we're headed. All right. Y'all can take that down now so they'll... Listen to our next announcement. Tonight, right here in the chapel, 7 o'clock p.m., the Center for Political Studies and Plaster School of Business are partnering together with Young America's Foundation to bring Peter Schweitzer to campus. So Peter's the president of the Government Accountability Institute. He's written a new book. He's written several books that are New York Times bestsellers, but he's written a new one just released called Blood Money, which is already hitting number one again. It documents the many ways that China is targeting America. You have to come find out what those are. So be here tonight for a serious conversation about these items at 7 o'clock p.m. here in the DMC. And then today, I am excited to introduce to you our speaker is Dr. Carl Truman. <laughs> Apparently, they already know who you are. He is a graduate of Cambridge and Aberdeen. He has taught at many different places, including currently at Grove City. I invited him to speak because he wrote a book, a couple of books, a lot of books, but this book in particular, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. And then there's a shorter version, which is called Strange New World. And so these books, the summer they came out, I spent time reading through these books and I thought this was just very insightful and very helpful. And so I emailed him and asked him if he would come and speak on these topics and help us to think through these things well. He was already busy and booked for 2023, and so this was as early as we could get him here to talk about these important, crucial topics. So if you're trying to make sense of how the world is functioning around us and how we can think through these things well with a biblical worldview, these books are going to help you do that. In fact, I have a bunch of copies of these books, and so I really don't need these copies. Who, who is an... Who's a student who wants to read the thick version? I'll give it to you. If you, all you have to do is promise to read it. You're going to read it? Come get it. All right, who wants the Cliff Notes version? <laughs> you want it? Come get it. You're already up out of your seat. Here you go. All right. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to worship through music, and then we'll worship through the word and through speaking. Dear Lord, these are indeed crazy times that we need to think well about, we need to think clearly about. Lord, we want to honor you. Uh, some of these things are confusing as we try to think through them, and so I pray that you would help us to honor you as your word says, to love you with all of our minds. I pray that you would help us to think well, to think deeply, to put aside other things, and to focus today our attention on how can we think about our culture and how can we think about our faith and how those two intersect each other. Lord, we want to be compassionate Christians that stand with conviction for your word, that please you and honor you well and that exalt you well because you're worthy. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for changing our lives. Help us to sing praises to your name today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you stand with us as we praise our risen Savior this morning? The Lord is my shepherd, and he is everything I need. So I will not worry, I will not fear the enemy. He's 
said that he loves me. He said that he's with me, even though I walk through the valley of shadow and death, and still I know he has good plans. He has good plans for me. So I will take heart in deserts and gardens. He has. Stay. 
God does not fail. You all can take a seat. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you all this morning. Uh, Let's open with a word of prayer. O oh Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, as we come now to contemplate your word, we pray that your spirit would lift our hearts and our minds uh, above this earthly sphere, that we might gaze upon Christ, the author and finisher of our salvation, as he sits at your right hand and intercedes for us. Lord, as we reflect upon your scriptures, upon events that took place so far away and so long ago, we ask that you would make their lessons immediate to us that we might find hope for the present and for the future. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles uh, with you, I wonder if you would turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 2. Uh, I want to speak today and tomorrow on two passages. Really, uh, the, the idea is I want to give you hope for the present and I want to give you some hope for the future as well. We live in very strange times where the stakes seem remarkably high. And the temptation to despair or the temptation to look for new solutions to what we consider to be novel problems can be overwhelming. I want to suggest to you from two passages in the Word of God that we have fully adequate answers to the problems that affect us both personally and as a wider society within the Word of God itself. So please turn with me to 1 Kings chapter 2. And we'll read from verse 15 and following. Probably, uh, certainly the way this passage culminates, one of the strangest passages in the Old Testament. Hear the word of the Lord. Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him opposite them, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And they said to him, behold now, there are with your servants 50 strong men, Please let them go and seek your master. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, you shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send. They sent therefore 50 men and for three days they sought him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho. And he said to them, did I not say to you, do not go? Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. He went up from there to Bethel, and while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore 42 of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria." Praise God for his holy word. We do live in very strange times, what we might say very dark times. Uh, Christianity seems to be, at least in the West, in decline. And at times such as this, there's a temptation to ask, where is God? Does he not speak anymore? Is he silent? We cannot see him, of course. We cannot touch him. Sometimes it seems that we cannot Hear him. And in such times, there are various temptations that come to mind. One of the most tempting, I think, at this present moment is to attach ourselves to big personalities, perhaps to put our trust in the strong man who seems able to deliver for us. We look for something tangible, something upon which we can rest for assurance of the future. Well, I want to suggest to you today 
that the way God will deal with us in the present, the way he will deal with the various problems that afflict our churches and our society at this time is the same as he has dealt with them in the past. And I want to make three points in this sermon. I want to suggest that God is still present and still speaks through his spirit and through his word. I want to encourage you by pointing you to the fact that God's word can reverse even the deepest curse and cleanse even the filthiest person. We live in a day, you might say, of extreme temptations. But there's nothing in this world that God cannot graciously deal with. And thirdly, I want to suggest that those of us who are part of the church, those of you who've grown up in Christian homes, who have the privilege to go to a college where God's word is honoured, a special responsibility falls upon you. And there are warnings in Scripture to remind us of that special responsibility. So let us turn then to the passage before us. How do I get from this passage to those three points? Well, first and perhaps most obviously and most briefly, the passage teaches us that God is present by his spirit and word, not by personalities. If you know your Old Testament history, you'll know that uh, the uh, passage occurs at a critical moment in the kingdom narratives of Israel. The great Elijah has passed from the scene. He's been taken to heaven in a chariot of fire and his successor, Elisha, has been left to literally, in this case, pick up the mantle and carry on the task of his great predecessor. And the prophets who've been loyal to Elijah are disturbed by this. They're worried that now that Elijah has gone, Things will take a dark turn for the worst. Little do they know, of course, that Elijah is actually the man who's going to bring everything home. Elijah merely set up the play. Elisha will be the man who brings it home in the battle against Baal. The prophets see the miracle of the Jordan when Elijah crosses, Elisha crosses the Jordan, but they still hanker for their old boss. What does that tell us? about human nature. I think we tend to attach ourselves to personalities and particular figures. We like something or somebody tangible to focus on. We know that bodily presence is important. Many of you probably live lives on social media, but there is no replacement, is there, for actually being in the presence of somebody you love. Maybe some of you do this weird thing where you're dating somebody. It sounds weird to me, but it's, uh, I gather it's sort of commonplace. You'll watch a movie with your loved one when you're separated, and you'll watch it simultaneously on your computer screens at the same time. That's weird to me. It's probably normal to you. Why? Because, well, it's, it's an attempt, isn't it, to recreate bodily presence, there's something nice about enjoying something simultaneously with somebody. The prophets here point us to that. It is not wrong, I think, that they miss Elijah. He has been a faithful leader to them for many years. But now he's gone. And they have to learn an important lesson. That God is present where his spirit is present and his word is spoken. Once that was in and through Elijah, now it is in and through Elisha. Christ's disciples will have to learn the same lesson. If you read John chapter 16, you read these words as Jesus is talking about his bodily departure from his disciples. Because I have said these things to you, he says, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away... The helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Their intuitions tell them that when Jesus goes, he will be absent from them. Jesus responds by pointing to the fact that actually his bodily departure will improve things in a strange way. No longer will his presence be restricted to the dimensions of his body. His presence will be wherever the helper, the Spirit is. 
So the first thing I want you to take from this passage is this. We live in very dark times, but that does not mean that God is absent from us. God is present with us today the same way he was in Elisha's day, the same way he was in the first century. God is present through his spirit and his word. And if you wish to survive in this hostile world that you are entering, then you need to presence yourself where God's word and God's spirit are present. And that I would suggest to you is primarily in the worship service of the gathered church where God's word is proclaimed. You are going out into a world that is far more hostile than the world I went out into. Uh, my first job teaching Reformation at a university of Reformation studies at the University of Nottingham in the United Kingdom. The only thing that mattered was my competence in the classroom. You are entering a world where whatever job you have, your Christian views on a whole variety of things might make you less employable or even unemployable. You may face challenges the like of which my generation never had to face. I dislike the language of snowflakes when it's applied to your generation because I do think in many ways the world in which you are growing up is much more difficult than the world in which I grew up. How are you going to survive? Well, you will not survive if you are not regularly under the sound of God's word and being led in praise and worship by God's ordained servants, Lord's day by Lord's day. The first thing then from this passage is, do not worry about the passage of big personalities. Do not be nostalgic for the past. We can learn from the past, but do not be nostalgic for the past. May your focus be on where God is present in word and spirit in the present. Secondly, God's word can reverse even the deepest curse and cleanse even the dirtiest person. It's a strange passage, really, in many ways, particularly the, the she-bears stuff at the end. But you won't understand the she-bears passage unless you understand the passage before. And I would suggest to you that the key to understanding this passage of Scripture is geography. If you don't know your Old Testament geography, you'll find the stories in this passage weird and strange. You need to understand the geographical significance of what is going on. And the first incident, the incident of the foul, poisonous water, takes place in Jericho. And Jericho is no ordinary city. Jericho has a deep biblical significance. It was the first city to fall to Joshua when he led the people back into the promised land. And he raised it to the ground. And then he cursed it. Joshua 6, verse 26. Joshua laid an oath on the people at that time, saying, Cursed before the Lord be the man who rises up and rebuilds this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn shall he lay its foundation. And at the cost of his youngest son, shall he set up its gates? So why is Jericho even there? Why are we even talking about Jericho, generations in the future? Well, the answer, of course, can be found in 1 Kings chapter 16. Remember, 1 Kings chapter 16 describes the rise to power of Ahab. Ahab, of course, is the man who doesn't just follow in the sins of his immediate predecessors. He doesn't just indulge in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, the man who introduced idolatry into post-Solomonic Israel. He's the man who marries the pagan princess and brings the worship of the Baals and the Ashtaroths back into the promised land. He brings back the old gods that had been expelled. And we're told this, in his, that is Ahab's days, heel of Bethel built Jericho. He laid its foundation at the cost of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Sagub, 
according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. That's why it's back. What was he doing? He was reversing history. He was trying to erase history. This man, Heel of Bethel, was part of the Ahab project of bringing back the old gods and eliminating the history of God's people. And now we hear that the water here is bad and the land unfruitful. Literally, actually, the text says, the land miscarries, the land aborts. It's probably a reference to miscarriages among animals and among the women. The waters were what we would now call, I suppose, an abortifacient. That was the effect they were having. Elisha calls for a bowl, puts salt in it, purifies the water. Uh, the dramatic action, the prophetic action here is not the main thing. It's the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says, we are told, I've healed the waters. Notice this, the word of God. It is the word of God which is powerful. And the prophet makes it clear that it is God, not him. He takes no credit to himself. This is what the Lord says. I have healed the waters. The word of God reverses the curse under which Jericho labors. What do we learn from that? I think we learn some magnificent and encouraging truths which should encourage us even in this day. I think it should encourage us personally in our own lives and I think it should encourage us more broadly when we look at the world around us. What does this action of the Lord tell us? One, I think it tells us something of the character of God. We might put it this way. God prefers mercy to justice. That is not to say God is not a just God, but it is to say he prefers mercy to justice. We see that again and again and again in the Old Testament, do we not? Again and again, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness murmur against the Lord, complain against the Lord, and he doesn't wipe them off the face of the earth. He gives them what they need. We see it again and again and again in the book of Judges where the Israelites ignore the Lord, rebel against the Lord and again and again and again he raises up somebody to save them from those who come to oppress them. It lies at the root of the plan of salvation. Isaiah 53 verse 6 All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The character of God prefers mercy to justice and we must not forget that in the way in which we interact with those around us today. And that leads to a second point. And that is, behold the depth and power of God's grace in the midst of what is really a cesspit. We might summarize a lesson perhaps of this particular incident in this way. There is no hole so dark and no cesspit so foul that God's word cannot make it light and make it clean. Jericho's very existence is an affront to God. It is the last place one might have expected mercy. Think of the world in which we live today. Think of the way in which we have dehumanized ourselves. Think of the way, I'm giving a lecture later this week actually at Catholic University in DC. It's an interesting week uh, to go from Cedarville uh, to Catholic University. But I'm giving a lecture and part of that lecture is on the effects of the sexual revolution. I'm making the point that the sexual revolution, which was meant to liberate us and make us into sexual subjects, those who act freely in sexual ways, has turned us in all into sexual objects. It has dehumanized us. It has promised us freedom and has delivered nothing but bondage and slavery. It is tempting in such a world, is it not, to think that it has become too foul for God's word to be powerful. Jericho's very existence is an affront to God. It's the last place one might have expected to find mercy. Might I suggest that Jerusalem in Christ's time is very similar. 
occupied by Rome, subject to a corrupt religious leadership. The temple turned into a place of buying and selling. The people of Jerusalem turning on Christ and demanding his execution. The very place where God's grace is displayed most powerfully and dramatically. That should be a word of encouragement personally to us. What have you done this week that has made you feel so dirty and so foul that you feel God's grace cannot extend to you? I suggest to you it can. The devil's most pungent lie is that you are too foul for God to touch. Christ touches dead bodies that under Old Testament law should have made him unclean. And what happens every time? The dead body, the most impure of all things, is restored to life and made clean. For you personally, I hope there is a gospel word of encouragement there. Do not believe the lie that you are too unclean for God. Jericho says otherwise. And secondly, maybe you're not a Christian here today. Perhaps you fear to go to God because you feel your life is too filthy. There are things you do and things you think that you think God could never touch without making himself dirty. Well, the great news is God did in Christ make himself dirty in order that you might be clean. There is no hole so dark and no spit so foul that God's word cannot make it light or make it clean. And that applies to our filthy world today just as it did to Jericho all of those centuries ago. And then thirdly, yet God's judgment is here to warn us about the importance of being faithful to him. The last uh, passage is an odd incident, isn't it? As a bald guy, I appreciate it. Now, maybe the passage here is that, you know, there is justice for bald guys at some point at the end of time. But it's weird. You, know, you read it and you think, well, what on earth is Elisha having a particularly humorous day and uses his prophetic powers to wreak havoc on these relatively innocent children? I remember being in Alaska many years ago, spoke at a camp there, and I was chatting to some guy, and I'm English, so I, you know, I'm an American now, but I'm really culturally English. You know, I don't understand guns. I'm probably the only unarmed man within 50 miles of my house in western Pennsylvania. And a guy was showing me his guns, and he showed me his big, I don't know, magnum of some kind, biggest handgun in the world. He said, I said, well, what do you need? Why that? You know, Alaska, you live in the middle of nowhere. What do you need a gun for? And he said, bears. And I said, why? He said, this is the only gun powerful enough to penetrate the skin of a bear. He said, if a bear comes running at you, he said, you fire five bullets into it. And I said, five bullets? I, I thought these guns had six bullets. And he said, son, trust me, you don't want to be caught alive by a bear. And I thought, wow, so the last bullet is for, for him. <laughs> Being savaged by a bear, not a, not a great thing. But I want to suggest... Geography is important here. Where does this take place? Bethel. Where is Bethel? Bethel is the place where the golden calves were set up by Jeroboam, son of Nebat, that led the people of Israel into idolatry and apostasy. We have a gang of boys here. They're described as little boys in the ESV that I read. That is not a particularly good translation. They are more likely adolescents. Notice they come out of the town. They're a gang on the hunt. This is not that he's walking past a bunch of ne'er-do-wells on the corner of a street and they call out and mock him. These guys are on the hunt. Secondly, notice that they know who he was. You might say, how do you know that? They know he's bald. You might say, well, wouldn't that be obvious to them? Only a non-bald person would think that. Why? This is the ancient Near East. If you're a bald guy, you do not go out in the sun without head covering. Elisha must be wearing a head covering. They knew he was bald. That means they knew who he was and they knew for whom they were looking. This is a pack on the hunt. 
They're abusive. Go up, you bald head. Some commentators say that's an allusion to the way Elisha departed. He went up. I don't think you need to, uh, to go there. We can say simply it's, it could easily mean kind of push off baldy. It's basically disrespect. And there are an awful lot of them. 42 of them were mauled. That would seem to imply that there were at least 43 involved. That's a lot of youths on the rampage looking for the man of God. What can we say about this? Well, I think it's interesting. You might say, is this not a bit crazy? Is this not a bit over the top? I would say, no, actually, what happens here is entirely predictable. It is predicted in Old Testament law. The passage you need to make a note of, to check later to make sure that I'm speaking truth, is this. Leviticus 26, verses 21 and 22, that reads as follows. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins. And I will let loose the wild beasts against you, which shall bereave you of your children. There is a prediction that if Israel persist in covenant breaking and defying God, he will unleash the wild beasts against their children. That's what happens in this passage in Kings. This is Bethel. You've had 70 years of idolatry in Bethel. 70 years since Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, set up those idols. And finally, the Lord's patience has run out. It's a catastrophic failure in parenting that we see here. The parents have failed to bring up their children well. They should have taught their children true worship. They should have taught their children about the holiness and the grace of God. But they clearly did not do so. What is the application of that for you here today? I would guess that many of you did not grow up in households like this. Many of you grew up in households where your parents taught you the word of God well and prayed for you. Pray for you faithfully, continue to pray for you faithfully. They taught you to respect the word of God. You now live or about to enter full time a world where the word of God is despised, trampled underfoot, spat upon, where the things that your parents taught you to hold as dear and important and vital to your spiritual health and well-being are routinely despised, if not positively pressed against. What I would suggest to you is this. Bear in mind this passage. This passage places a responsibility upon you. God prefers mercy to justice, but he remains just. God prefers grace to justice, but to those to whom much has been given, much will be expected. When you enter the workplace, when you leave university, do not forget the things that your professors here taught you. More than that, do not forget the things that your parents and your pastors have taught you. The world will preach all kinds of idolatrous myths to you. You've been taught well. Cling to those things that you were taught. So, a strange passage, but three things for your comfort, for encouragement, and for warning. And with a warning, be faithful. God is not mocked, but be encouraged. God prefers mercy to justice. And do not despair in this world where so much noise seems to crowd out the voice of God. God speaks today and is present today as he has always been speaking and present with his people in and through his word and his spirit. Let us pray. Oh Lord God and loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for words of encouragement from your word. We pray, 
Lord, as we face all kinds of pressures from the world around us, you would not allow us to despair, but we would come again and again under the sound of your word and be led by that word to the throne of grace where our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, ever lives to make intercession for us, pleading on our behalf. We thank you, God, that we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weaknesses, but who is tempted in every way as we are. We ask, O oh God, that you might seal that gospel again and again upon our hearts. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>